Chapter 2. No one is alone. The Fresno sky was still the exact same shade of bright blue as Ella's eyes, but it lacked the shock he imagined her glare would contain. After that speech about smiling yesterday, you have the gall to frown? Martin asked. What's wrong? August rubbed his face and forced himself to relax. I haven't been back since my mother. No, said Martin, scowl deepening. You look anxious, not sad. You don't allow yourself to look sad anymore, but nerves I recognize. People usually felt too awkward to continue speaking when August brought up his mother and his grief, and it was the easiest way to avoid topics he didn't want to discuss, like Ella. Can you let me have this moment of weakness, August asked, considering that your father will feed me to a bear if I don't return you in five days? No. Martin checked the silver pocket watch he kept fastened to his waistcoat and snapped it shut with a sigh. The glare made the time unreadable. It's It's brighter here than in the city. They had been traveling since well before dawn and had spent the last few hours on foot. Isn't it lovely? August asked, trying to enjoy what he could before the reality of why they were in Fresno required his attention. If he focused on only the grim facts and his own anxiety about seeing Ella, then they would consume him. Fresna is over these hills, though most of the fields we've been walking past belong to people from town. It's too hot to be lovely, muttered Martin, and he pulled a broad-brimmed hat from his bag. You're already turning pink. Because I'm flushed with life, August said, but he accepted the hat when Martin offered it. The pair of them were on the outskirts of town, at the final hill blocking Fresno from view, and he gestured for them to keep walking. Mayor Blanche Forgonier will be at the inn. Most likely. I did not know her, and unless she'd sold it, it's her family business. They crested the hill, and the town came into view. Fresno was quaint, a sort of sun-soaked market town, where everyone knew each other and gossiping was the most common hobby. Most of the buildings were plain but neat wood with thatched roofs. And most of the people who didn't work on the nearby estates ran shops with living quarters on the second floor. Fresh flowers decorated the doorways, scenting the air. The familiar canopy of the ash tree at the center of town rustled in the breeze. The sight of it all stopped August in his tracks. The day of his mother's funeral was a blur, but his other memories weren't. The clutch of grief was sharper here. The image of his mother gliding down the street before them, one hand on his father's arm and the other twirling freshly picked wildflowers was clear as day in his mind, and he tilted his head back to keep from crying. It wasn't only that he had lost his mother, his childhood had died with her. He and Ella had become aware of death in a way few children ever were. No one has seen you, Martin said softly, his tone far gentler than it usually was. You could turn back and I'll investigate alone if being here is too much. No, I can't, said August, taking a deep breath. But thank you. Don't mention it. August chuckled and dropped his head. You're the only person in the world who means don't mention it sincerely. They made their way into town. Fresno was as beautiful as August remembered. But the farther they walked, the more uneasy he grew. The stalls were set up in the market square, littered with interesting trinkets and perfect produce. But there wasn't anyone pursuing. No elderly couples gossiped from shaded chairs and not a single soul waved from the doorway of a shop the streets were bare every shutter was drawn fresno was the very first time for him felt bereft well this is different said august peering down an empty street side street there weren't even shoe prints in the dirt and unsettling was it not usually like this asked martin Take a guess, August muttered, 
and looked down the street where the seamstress lived. Ella had almost always been there when he, he visited. The shops don't even look open. Ella wasn't there now, though. No one was. Who are you looking for? Martin asked. Anyone, honestly. August straightened out and nodded to the three-story building ahead. That's the inn. And what's down that path? Martin looked down his nose and over August's shoulder to the seamstresses. August was tall, like his mother, but Martin was towering. Most people told him what he wanted to know out of misplaced fear. I don't know. Nothing. And no one, apparently, said August. Ella had been the one to stop writing, and Lady Tremaine had been very clear. They had grown apart. He shouldn't be looking for her. Adroit August strikes again, muttered Martin, and August rolled his eyes. You're running out of synonyms, aren't you? I have no notion of what you mean, said Martin, sniffing. Good, said August, opening the door to the inn. I'll pretend I don't know what you meant, and we'll both be undistracted. The first door of the inn was a large, dimly lit room of warm wood. Dining tables and chairs covered most of the floor, leaving enough room between them and the counter for folks to carry luggage impeded. A sense of fresh bread and leek soup lingered in the air, and elegant roses decorated every table. August made his way to the counter, smiling at the little display shelf of sundries travelers might need. There was no one around, but the place felt livelier and better cared for than it used to. Mayor Fauconier, he called out, Blanche? A stout woman, maybe a decade older than August, with curly red hair and a splatter of freckles across her nose, hustled down the stairs at the far side of the room. She was smaller than August, remembered. Or perhaps everyone had appeared tall to him when he was a child. Hello, August said, smiling. How are you? She came to a stop across from him, hands wrestling, resting on the counter, and nodded in greeting. I can't complain. The familiar response made him chuckle. Her father had said the same whenever asked, and she had started saying it after he died. August had heard it ne nearly every morning when walking through the Fresno streets with Ella as they got breakfast from the bakery. Now, we've got plenty of rooms available, and you can have your pick of them, she said, giving him a tight smile and pulling a log book out from be behind the counter. She relaxed when she gripped the book, as if running the inn was a comfort, were a comfort rather than a sentimental chore of sudden inheritance. The idea filled August with a joyful grief. He had missed so many changes. I'll need names and dates for your stay. Two beds, please, Blanche. But we, sorry, she said, and looked him up and down. Have we met? August winced and he had never been so happy that Martin wasn't inclined to laughter. We have met, Blanche narrowed her eyes at him, fingers tapping against the counter. I used to be shorter when my family came here for the summer, August said, and smiled again, holding out his hand. August. August? She knocked his hand aside and pulled him into a tight hug from over the counter. Look at you! Oh, you take after your mother, don't you? The sentiment landed more sweet than bitter after so long without her. I do, he said, smiling even more widely. You look well, too, Mayor F Fuconier. Mayor, when did that happen? No one else wanted the job. And I didn't mind taking on the work, she laughed. What are you doing here? Last anyone heard, you were at university. I was at university for what felt like centuries he said, keenly aware of how little people here knew about him. His parents had always presented themselves as nobles who needed to escape the city during the summer. Most noble children were sent away to study at university, and those who didn't inherit could stay on for further education or training. He gestured to Martin. We're here on behalf of the royal court to conduct an initial investigation into the memory lost. In five days, we'll return and report our findings. That sobered her up quickly. Well, you certainly have grown up, she said, and nodded at Martin. Come, sit. You were always a nice boy, August, but why you? 
August smiled instead of taking offense. <clears throat> Most people who called him nice really meant he was naive. He had heard it often enough, given his cheery disposition, and he had learned long ago not to fight the point. Most people saw kindness and optimism as the opposites of cleverness and realism. But August didn't. Eventually, people would realize he was nice and capable. August volunteered for the job, Martin said. We work for the royal court investigating crimes and oddities outside the purview of the guards. They sat down at one of the empty tables. Blanche was all business, putting a small notebook from her coat pocket and setting it on the table. Martin laid his own notes next to it. We're less intimidating than soldiers and easier to talk to, said August. Risk assessment, bookkeeping, and co- clandestine inquiry is what we called it at school. Good on you, she said, and patted August's shoulder. You were always a dab hand at numbers, and I'm sure the others will be happy to see you again. Thank you. August felt himself flush at the compliment. I am sorry I'm back under these circumstances, but I didn't want them to send someone who had never been to Fresno when I was perfectly capable of helping. The circumstances are hardly your fault, Blanche said and smiled. It was a good choice, though. Everyone's on edge worrying about who's next and what will happen if no one gets their memories back, and so people are clamming up. Hopefully with you they'll be more open. I hope so, said August, offering up his most consoling smile. I shall make no promises, but I would like to get this solved quickly for everyone. Then let's get to it, she said. Her mouth was set in a grim scowl. What do you need to know? So how does it happen? August asked. Blanche sighed. One day, they have their memories, and the next, they're gone. It's like someone reaches into their mind and plucks out every single memory of a person. There's no warning or signal, but it was obvious with a few. Monsieur Allure, Blaise, and Madame Monet. We were almost certain we caught the day they forgot. With the other two, we're not sure. Monsieur Allard was the cop- gobbler, cobbler, and August had fond memories of the older man teaching him all sorts of fun ways to lace his boots so that they looked like rabbit ears or flowers. Blaze had been a local legend, a villager who was serving as a guard in the royal city with their best friend when August was in Fresne. Madame Monet had not heard of until the letter yesterday. The other two are Henry Horrocks and Lucy Renaud, right? August asked. Neither of their names were familiar to me. They wouldn't be, said Blanche. Blanche, Henry's only a few years older than you and moved here with his parents about seven years ago. Lucy is mostly self-sufficient and rarely comes into town. She's not being cooperative and refuses to believe she forgot anyone. Thankfully, the neighbor she forgot has never seemed fond of her, so there's so much so there's not mu- been much disruption to her life. August sat back in his chair, thinking it over. Is it always only one person that's forgotten? So far as we can tell, yes, said Blanche, and she tapped her book. Reading upside down, August could tell she was looking at the notes on Madame Monet. We haven't found anything definite that connects all of them. Leave that to us, August said, and glanced at the notes Martin and he had brought. So five people have completely forgotten their memories of a person, and despite the work of multiple physicians, they have been unable to recover the lost memories? That's in a nutshell, Blanche said. It was worrisome that they recovered no memories. Complete memory loss like that are rare, and when he'd researched it last night, he'd found no record of it being focused on one person. It made August afraid in a way he hadn't been before. Has anyone described what they do remember? Martin asked, and his frown deepened at Blanche's shrug. It's like I said, the memories of the person have been plucked. Madame Monet remembers eating breakfast the day her husband left, but he's not there in her memory. Only her son is. Curious, mumbled Martin. That is incredibly and oddly precise. If you say so, said Blanche, people have plenty of opinions, 
and theories, but no real answers. That's perfectly fine, August said. He already had a dozen things he wanted to investigate once they left here. Now, the only question remaining is what happens after the memory loss. Are people able to form new memories with the person they had forgotten? Or do they forget them all over again? Blanche laughed. Why, yes, they can form new memories. Henry Horrocks is actually the one bright spot of this whole surdied mess. He had forgotten his co-worker, Danielle. They've, they've since met again. He still cannot remember any of their interactions from before they were introduced, reintroduced. But they're making plenty of new memories. The two got married last year. That's sweet, August said, grinning. The good news had probably been a boon for the pair and for Fresne. We don't have proof it will hold, said Martin, tapping a finger against his mouth. What if he for forgets her all over again? Best prepare for that. August inhaled and patted Blanche's hand, her knuckles white from how hard she was gripping her notes. Martin likes to prepare for the worse, and while it can be disheartening, it does mean almost nothing takes us from by surprise. August said, No, we don't want to interrupt everyone's lives, but we do need to speak with the people who lost their memories, and maybe those whom they'd forgot. Madame Monet is usually home right now, and Monsieur Alludes almost certainly working, she said, and stood. I'll send word for the others to meet you at the inn tonight. Before you head off, let me know, let me show you to your room and get you settled. Blanche had just for gestured for them to follow her upstairs. After a few years of traveling, August and Martin had learned to travel light. Each of them had only a single pack, which earned an odd look from Blanche, and she led them up to the third floor. There weren't that many rooms up here, and she took them to the door farthest from the stairs. If more people rented rooms, August and Martin would be undisturbed. Blanche handed August the key. Now, she said, pushing the door open. You've got two beds and a room for bathing. Ring the bell when you need hot water and it will be brought up to you. Meals aren't set. We've always got a little something going, but if you want anything specific, let me know. The room was a large corner space with plenty of natural light and a desk beneath one of the windows. Two small beds were pushed up against opposite walls and a little curtain separated the living space from the bathing area. Martin set his bag on the bed near the door, and August dropped his into the chair at the desk. While Martin took most of their notes as they worked, August preferred going over them later. This would be ideal for that. Will this do? Blanche asked. It's perfect, said August, liking how she smiled. At least someone in Fresno was happy to see him. Thank you. Ring if you need anything, she said and pointed to the bell on the desk. I'll go track down everyone and tell them you're here. Madame Monette lives in the old carpenter's house. You remember where that is. And Monsieur alludes where he always has been. She left, and August leaned over the desk, forehead against the thick window glass. The glass was pretty, but distorted his view outside. A wavy figure walked down the main street. Do you remember where the carpenter's house is? Martin asked once the sound of Blanche's footsteps grew distant. August snorted. Not even a little bit. I'll ask someone when we leave. Not a lot to go on, Martin said softly. We're going to have to pry into people's lives and determine if someone caused this deliberate, deliberately. You didn't ask her about that. August paced the length of the room. I didn't want to upset her or make her defensive before we've even started. The quiet stillness of the town beyond the inn's windows made a skin crawl. There was a small jug of water in the bathing area, and he splashed his face. There was no time to waste. Fresno shouldn't have been like this. The familiar snap of Martin checking his watch echoed in the room. Ready? August ran a hand through his hair and nodded. Let's go. The sooner they spoke to everyone, the sooner they hopefully solved this. August took the lead going down the stairs. Martin followed a few steps behind him. The click of his pocket watch chained against his buttons like a timer. They didn't have any time to lose.
and August wasn't sure if he could track down Blanche again to ask about the carpenter's house. He stepped into the first floor and rounded the corner into the main room and slammed into someone else. August fell back and cracked his elbows against the floor. Whomever he had struck let out an oof. Oh, drat, they cried. I'm so sorry, August said, pushing himself up and rubbing his smarting arms. Silver Speck spotted his vision. Are you all right? I think so, they, dis- they said. For now. August looked over to them, and words failed. Ella, so familiar and so different, knelt on the floor. Gone were the round, dimpled cheeks she had had last he saw her, and her curls had darkened to a honey blonde. Her simple dress was patched with small floral designs. The sight of her filled him with such overwhelming longing for their friendship. But when he tried to say her name, he couldn't. Chest tight. He cleared his throat. She didn't look up from the crushed hat in her hands. Is that the only casualty, he asked. I don't think it's a mortal wound, she said, and let out an awkward chuckle. More than his elbow stung now that he knew she didn't recognize his voice. She shrugged and looked up, and August offered a hand to help her stand. The brush of her bare fingers around his palm felt far more tender than an embrace, and she slipped her hand from his the moment she was standing. She stared up at him, scrutinizing his face. Her nose was scrunched up like it used to be when she was thinking like a child, as a child. August smiled at the familiar sight, though a part of him twisted under her scrutiny. You're, she muttered. Something like recognition flashed through her blue eyes. August? She threw her arms around his neck and relief forced aside his petty anger. It's so good to see you, Ella said into his shoulder. And then she pulled back suddenly and clasped her hands in front of herself, and she blushed. Was it good to see him? Her years of silence would have suggested otherwise. August stared at her, uncertain as to what to say or do, and keenly aware of the awkwardness settling between them. It's very good to see you too. What are you doing here, she asked. Behind him, Martin cleared his throat. Right, propriety. August should have should start late there. Martin, may I introduce you to Ella? August asked and gestured between them. Ella, this is Martin Tremblay. Ella curtsied light, slightly. It's nice to meet you, sir. And you, mademoiselle, Martin replied. She smiled quickly at Martin and glanced at August. Again, she asked, what are you doing here? We were sent by the royal court to investigate the memory loss, said August. You've heard about it, I assume. Heard about it, she said, blinking. Of course I have. You're who the court sent in response to Blanche's request? It's why I went away to school, he said. We're trained to be helpful, from balancing budgets to finding embezzlers and con artists who are trying to manipulate magic to their own wills. August had wanted his skill set, in a history that would make Charmant proud to call him their king one day. And so he had set out to solve the issues no one else did, no matter how small or insignificant the problem seemed. It wasn't about the learning, though. He had learned quite a lot in the last few years. It was about actually doing something. Even if that something was interesting, increasing funds to a certain province and trusting that they knew what they were doing when they said they could fix things if they had the resources. These sto- those stories weren't all that interesting, though. That last one was only ha- has only happened twice, said Martin. It's mostly embezzling. It's happened twice, which is two times too many, August said, hoping Ella would ask about it. Most people did. Most of our work involves investigation and problem solving concerning rare things like magic. There's never been a specific group to handle it, so we've taken it on until one is officially informed, which would be soon, if August had his way. But changing things like that was slow going. Oh, that's why. That makes sense. Why else would you come after all, she said, as though she had expected something else. She shook her head, squared her shoulders, and smiled slightly. That's good. 
Though, I didn't know this is the sort of thing you do now. How would she know what he did now? August flexed his hands, trying to think of a kinder way to respond. Her smile was already forced. She seemed equal parts thrilled and disappointed that he had returned. We only got here, so we've yet to speak to anyone involved, he said, ignoring the way Martin tried to catch his eye. How are you doing? Well, busy, she said and held up the hat. She bounced onto her toes like a bird about to take flight. I was running errands, had to give Blanche a note from Lady Tremaine, and then I'm off to Madame Monette's, and I don't want to keep you from your work. It made August uneasy. She had never been so contrite. She shifted as if to leave, and August reached out after her. Wait! It came out sharper when, than he expected, and he stuffed his hand into his pocket. We were actually hoping to speak to Madame Monet. A friendly face, even just for the introduction, might help put Madame Monet and the others at ease. She hesitated. And before she could decline, he added, Also, to be honest, I don't remember my way around town and didn't want to correct Blanche when she assumed I did. Martin looked like he might smother August in his sleep, but Ella didn't notice. Her nose wrinkled, and then she nodded. I have to be home before supper, though. I cannot be late. Surely they could speak with each other like acquaintances long enough for him to find out why she had stopped writing. Of course, said August, gesturing to the door of the inn. I'll escort you ho home after. Her expression changed in a blink, the hesitant awkwardness turning cold. She looked at him with her frost blue eyes, but it was like she didn't actually see him. That won't be necessary, she said, voice flat and emotionless. I shall introduce you to Mad Madame Monet, but there's no need for you to join me after that. Perhaps Martin was right. August was too optimistic.